Uh, Dennis Cuddy uh, is with us. He received a Ph.D. from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and uh, he taught in the public school system and at the university level. He also was a political risk analyst for an international consulting firm. He authored and edited four books on American foreign relations and immigration. He's authored numerous articles, and he served as a senior associate with the U.S. Department of Education in Washington, D.C. And, uh, John, he's really your friend. Why don't you take it from here? Well, he's also author of uh, two what I call very important small books, The Road to Socialism and the New World Order, and Secret Records Revealed the Men, the Money, and the Methods Behind uh, the World Order. You'll see Dr. Cuddy's editorials in USA Today from time to time, usually in a point of rebuttal against some socialist mainline propaganda. But anyway, welcome to the show, Dr. Cuddy. Thank you for having me. The, the term New World Order uh, quite frequently is as being a product of, say, downstream from the Protocols of Zion, that long-debunked anti-Semitic document that uh, some right-wing groups use. But the term New World Order didn't really originate on the right, did it? No, uh, and, and let me digress, but it's, it's important. Uh, there's an effort among, uh, I guess, C. Wright Mills used to call them the power elite. And uh, C. Wright Mills, of course, is, is not a conservative at all. He's, in fact, he was something of a socialist. Uh, his book is read widely in university reading classes for uh, their courses. And uh, what, what you have generally is a, a counter uh, argument that goes on, uh, sometimes a preemptive strike, actually. When the controversy over humanism came up, you, you would find the mainline uh, media saying, oh, well, no one knows what it is. It's somewhere obscure. It's just a few people if there is anything. And anybody who took the time just to take a basic look could find out that the International Humanist and Ethical Union had four million members and they had volumes uh, out uh, explaining how they were going to undermine the public schools and uh, undermine Christianity. But uh, no one in the uh, mainstream media paid any attention same thing with the New World Order. Whenever you uh, bring that topic up, they'll start talking about, oh, this is uh, some kind of crazy conspiracy theory, like uh, McCarthyism, uh, seeing commies uh, uh, behind every tree and so on. But uh, what I try to do is go to the sources themselves. Uh, for example, on the issue of McCarthyism, I go to uh, Carl Bernstein of uh, Word Wooden Bernstein fame, Watergate. Watergate, right. Uh, in his book, uh, Loyalty is a Son's Memoirs, where it's a conversation uh, between his parents and himself, uh, who, and his parents were members of the Communist Party here, and uh, his father especially was saying, I'm worried, Carl, about this book you're going to write because you're going to clean McCarthy up. People said McCarthy is a liar, but he was not. He was actually correct. We were a force in the country. And he goes on, in essence, they had duped the mainline media. Of course, they were primarily willing to be duped at the time. Now we have revelations uh, from the Venona documents and others that actually there was a communist element in high positions in the government. So what I try to do is use those types of sources. Uh, Carl Bernstein, for example, has a very high reputation among the power elite uh, and the mainstream uh, media. So when I talk about the New World Order, I will try to use quotes from Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, and go to uh, the people's diaries, their private papers. Uh, for example, Woodrow Wilson's chief advisor was a Colonel uh, Edward Mandel House, who uh, covertly wrote a book called Philip Drew Administrator describing uh, socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx, and that's what they wanted. Uh, Franklin Lane, uh, one of the uh, secretaries under Wilson, said everything in Philip Drew was coming to pass under Woodrow Wilson. Uh, the point of this is uh, Colonel House was in his diary. There's only about three copies of this, I think, in existence. It's never been published, and I got one of them. Is explaining in his diary in 1919, looking backwards, that uh, Clemenceau and Orlando from uh, France and Italy, the premiers, were very concerned about these Bolsheviks and their revolution. And they wanted to see if they could stop it militarily. And in this diary, uh, House is saying how he convinced uh, Clemenceau, Orlando, and even uh, his own president, Wilson, that they could not do this. And then he confides in his diary, of course, I knew that we could. Only a small uh, armament of small tanks and voluntary mercenaries could have put this down. So, in effect, you have one person changing the entire course of history. If you think about the millions of people slaughtered under the Bolsheviks, the uh, nuclear holocaust that was hanging over our head for decade after decade. So when you go to these people's private diaries, papers, and use reputable sources, 
it's very clear that there is this new world order that's been going along for a long time. Uh, where do you see the the term first really being used, the new world order? It's become such a, a buzzword today. Uh, when, uh, how did that evolve? Well, it, it comes in various uh, forms. Some people say Novus Ordo Seclorum on the dollar bill at the time meant that, and, and it does in a way. Specifically, the, the term new world order uh, goes back to... I guess the most famous book is H.G. Uh, Wells, who was a Fabian socialist and had uh, broken with the other Fabians because he wanted this out in the open. He wrote a book called The Open Conspiracy Blueprint for World Revolution. He uh, authored in 1939 a book by the title new world, The New World Order, which he mapped out and showed how it would come about. It would be a synthesis between Eastern communism and Western capitalism into a world socialism. But uh, even uh, prior to that, you would have people like Wilson, I believe, delivered a speech in Minneapolis in 1919. You're talking about Woodrow Wilson, right? Right, Woodrow yeah. Wilson, where he was talking about uh, the order of the new world. And they would use those terms, but not necessarily in that order. You had books titled The New World Order even prior to Wells. There was one by a man named uh, uh, Samuel Zane Batten from the uh, American Baptist Society of all places saying we need this world socialism. That was 1919. So there, there are books by the title The New World Order going back at least that far. Uh, then the concept, of course, goes back to in the last century, the 1800s, uh, Edward Bellamy's book and, and some other books generally talk about that sort of thing. Uh, you have the general concept going far back. Um, the Baha'is, uh, Baha'u'llah in the last century around 1850 was talking about the need for a world government. Uh, at the actual, the first I can tell major person was Dante in 1313 AD in his book De Monarchia claiming that we needed a government for the, the world, a world government. So the concept of world government goes far back. The actual use of the term New World Order in, in terms of a book title goes back to at least 1919 and then the concept even before that. Now we see uh, in, the, I think it was in 34, when uh, we see the occult, occultic overtones introduced also through Al Alice Bailey, didn't we? Right. Her, uh, <clears throat> uh, going back uh, into the, the previous century, uh, Madame Blavatsky had been part of this, the revolutionary element that had come up after the French Revolution and the League of the Just with Karl Marx and so on. And she had joined Garibaldi in the middle of the last century and formed the Theosophical Society. And, uh, and after her was uh, Annie Besant took over. And then after her, Alice Bailey, whose books were first published around 1921 uh, with Lucifer Publishing Company. Which is now called Lucis Trust. Uh, right. And the next year they right. they changed their name to Lucis Trust and Lucis is they used to be housed up at the UN, the UN Plaza. They moved down the street now on uh, Wall Street, I believe. But they would uh, supervise to some extent the UN Meditation Room and, and so on. But anyway, in the twenties, uh, Alice came up with a new group of world servers, the Arcane School, World Goodwill, and so forth. And in the 30s, she started writing supposedly from these ascended masters. She was getting these telecommunications or whatever, where she would say, we need a new world order with points of light connected to service, if, if you've heard that phrase recently. That was, <laughs> that was George Bush, uh, right? President Bush, yeah. But the, uh, this, that's what fascinates me from just a whole other angle is the intertangling of uh, channeling demons, whatever, uh, encouraging this whole thrust. That, that fascinates me from a, from a theological point of view. It seemed that Alice Bailey had a plan for education. Now, as I recall, Robert Mueller uh, has sort of given credit to Alice Bailey and Joel Cole. Joel Cole was the demon spirit that she channeled for his World Corps curriculum, which is being used in education today. Yeah, they, um, they had a number of books. Uh, one was Initiation, Human and Solar, and uh, she gets into some, as you indicated, some very occult things. And she also had a uh, volume published, Education in the New Age. She would talk about we need the new age. And uh, she would spell that out. And H.G. Wells did some similar things with uh, education, how that would be one of their forces for developing this world socialist government. Uh, and Robert Mueller, uh, of course, you know, ever since the 1950s, an assistant secretary at the U.N., probably was uh, familiar with a lot of this and so when he developed his world core curriculum that they uh, have put into what's called the Robertson down in Arlington, Texas, it says in the introduction of that that it's based on the underlying principles of uh, Alice Bailey, which would be from that Joao Cool Ascended Master, supposedly. Okay. One of the most fascinating quotes in Dr. Cuddy's research 
has been from Carol Quigley's book. Now, Carol Quigley was George Cl uh, was Bill Clinton's mentor at Georgetown University, and as I recall, Dennis, uh, President Clinton twice now has paid public homage to to uh, Professor Quigley for the influence that the professor had on his life. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and he's um, <clears throat> delivered a speech at Georgetown uh, prior to his election, and then uh, during his acceptance speech at the Democratic nomination uh, in '92 when he was elected, he singled uh, Quigley out as a great influence on what he'd done. He actually, I found out from the biographer, or one of them, of Bill Clinton, that uh, the president still has the copy of *A Tragedy and Hope* on his bookshelf uh, where he lives. Okay, but let, let, I don't, Chuck, yeah. has, you've got to read this quote. Yes, this, this a quote from the book really sort of gives you an insight. There's so many people, uh, Christian and pseudo-Christian uh, authors and ministries, that are making such an emotional thing about Christians even being aware of these tides and trends, and that's one reason we're trying to focus on this with our guest. But uh, uh, reading from uh, Clinton's mentor, uh, Professor Quigley, it, it reads as follows, for example. There does exist and has existed for a generation an international network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes communists act. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the roundtable groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the communists or any other groups and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network because I've studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years in the early 60s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it and, mo and uh, to most of its aims and have for much of my life been close to it and to many of its interests, both in the past and recently to a few of its policies, but in general my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown, and I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known, close quote. I guess by roundtable group, Dennis, he's talking about the Council on Foreign Relations, am I correct? Uh, well, <clears throat> let me uh, cl clarify that. Uh, you're, you're basically right, but I'll give you the 30 seconds. Of thing. Okay. Uh, Cecil Rhodes uh, who formed the Rhodes Scholars, uh, the Rhodes Scholarships, of which Bill Clinton and Strobe Talbot and others uh, were nominated and selected, uh, formed a secret society called the Society of the Elect. It had a circle of initiates and, and so forth. Uh, the Association of Helpers were formed after Rhodes' death by Lord Alfred Milner, and they formed the Round Table Groups, which were semi-secret organizations from which in England came the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and in this country, the Council on Foreign Relations. Which was originally the Institute on Foreign Affairs, but they just right. changed the name. Of right. which uh, Mandel House was involved as well, Colonel House. Right, Colonel uh, Edward Mandel House was the, the leading force in setting that up in uh, 1921. That was almost 10 years after he'd set up the Federal Reserve back in the Bank in 1913. Right, 1913, so. which was a key element, and that too was something of a, quote, conspiracy, according to the, one of the members involved in it. Because they met in secret and politicians and bankers who met to do this, right? Right. Uh, Frank Vanderlip was one of the few people who were on that car, in the, uh, the box car that went down to Jekyll Island. He said they couldn't use their names. They had to have code, code names. They couldn't be seen with each other. And he wrote this up in the 1935 in the Saturday Evening Post saying he'd never felt more like a conspirator in his life. <laughs> Can you give us, uh, uh, we've been talking about history a little, uh, can we, uh, Dennis, can you give us some feeling of uh, more modern, more recent uh, events like NAFTA, GATT, and so forth that are consistent with this whole uh, tri tide and trend? Right. In the, the little booklet, Secret Records Revealed, I, I try to track this through because uh, many people, whenever you talk about the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, are uh, very skeptical. They say, well, this is some sort of right-wing conspiracy theory. But uh, Quigley would refer in that book uh, that you were quoting from uh, that the CFR was a, quote, front organization for the power elite. Not only that, the year before Quigley's book, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, a very famous historian and with the Kennedy administration in his book, A Thousand Days, said the same thing. And he's a member. He said the CFR is a front for uh, the power elite, along with the um, Rockefeller, Ford, and Carnegie foundations. He called them fronts. So they're very bold about that, and the Rhodes Scholars, uh, there are many of them in the Clinton administration. One is uh, Richard Gardner, who uh, back in the Council on Foreign Relations Journal, which is called Foreign Affairs in April of 74, would say that uh, to get to our house of world order, it would be better to erode national sovereignty piece by piece than the old-fashioned frontal attack. And then he went on and explained how they would use GATT to do that, and this is, this is 1974 about almost 23 or so years ago. And so the plan had uh, been in the works for, for quite some time. The idea being if you develop uh, regional economic arrangements 
again, part of part of Cecil Rhodes' uh, Association of Helpers back in the 1940s, uh, a fellow named Corbett would write about this. You have to develop regionalism first, regional economic entities first, uh, before you can then have a world economy, and then you will say the world economy must be managed by a world government. It was a step-by-step strategy, which has been going on for many, many decades. The plan has been laid out. And NAFTA and GATT are, are tremendous parts of it because then you, what you do is you shift people's loyalties from their nation to their economic interest, which may lay uh, may lie in these, uh, let's say, NAFTA and then APEC and the Asian Pacific and the European community. And therefore, in terms of socialism, you would find the phrase applicable workers of the world unite. We become workers. And you find the schools today going into the outcome-based education school to work because they're preparing students, you'll hear this phrase, to compete in the global economy. Right. So you transfer people's thought processes to this global uh, development that's going on, and therefore they're no longer uh, seen as extremely loyal to their nation. We even see, saw this, I think, manifested in the State of the Union address recently, where President Clinton, throughout that speech, speaks of global this and global that. And uh, that's one reason we wanted to sort of bring all this out for our listeners, is because there, there is a uh, view being promoted that uh, somehow a, an awareness of these things uh, suggests that you're some kind of uh, extreme right conspiracy buff, when in fact it's just one of being aware of a manifest tide that's even, uh, uh, using just the writings of the left, not the right, to, uh, to understand uh, uh, what the agenda is and what its manifest destiny would appear to be. Is that fair, John? I would say so. Dennis, you know, we've got about two and a half minutes left. Why don't you tell us about Strobe Talbot? This one's sort of unique. Uh, well, Strobe Talbot uh, is a Rhodes Scholar Bill Clinton who wrote uh, in the summer prior to Clinton's first election that perhaps national sovereignty is not such a great idea after all and that the case for world government is clinched. He wrote that in Time magazine. And uh, after that, he received the, a Global Governance Award from the World Federalist Association uh, and President Clinton wrote a congratulatory letter to the WFA saying that he uh, thought this was a fine selection of Strobe Talbot, and Clinton noted that their previous president, Norman Cousins, had worked for world peace and world government, I mean, he specifically used that term, and he concluded the letter by wishing this organization, quote, future success. Their sole reason for existence is to have a world federal government. So we have this support. Uh, another Rhodes Scholar, Robert Reich, to pick up on what Chuck said, uh, wrote in a book, uh, I don't know what an American company is anymore. You're all uh, primarily multinationals. So I try to use their own words to demonstrate what we're talking about. That's an interesting example you use, because I used to be a senior executive with Ford Motor Company, one of road, Dearborn, Michigan. I left Ford at the late, at the end of the 68-69 uh, uh, time period, and when I left the Ford Motor Company, over half their assets were outside the United States. In other words, these multinational corporate exporters, importers, they're legally, structurally straddle borders, and I think that's another uh, dimension to all this. Another word has come up here, John, that you uh, mentioned very briefly. Uh, you notice the word has shifted from New World order to global governance. I'd, right. You mentioned that, but I'd like to really emphasize that for our listeners, that the buzzwords are shifting. And Can you comment on that, John? Well, glo- it, New World Order became a liability. I think what surprised everybody, uh, and I think Dennis will back me up on this, is that when President Bush first began to say New World Order, most people in the public said, for those who have been following chair, <laughs> because he was using it in public. Not only was he doing that, he was quoting from Alice A. Bailey, whom is a known occultist. So this set up red flags real quick, and a lot of us were quick to jump on that. So it became a liability within about two years. And now the slide is to global governance. And you notice how it's a slight twist, Dennis, and I'm sure you could elaborate on this, the fact that they will say, well, we're not new global government, we have global governance. Well, how do you have governance without some kind of legal structure intact? And that's ultimately what we're talking about at these United Nations summits now. I'm trying to soften it with the idea of a federated collection of right. nations. It's like Dr. Yeah. Cuddy said. We talk about the thing. We, we be, have to be prepared to compete in the coming century. Clinton is now repeating this mantra over and over again. You'll hear other mantras in education, such as the school to work, you know, lifelong learning. That's the next buzzword you'll hear. And it sounds good, but it doesn't mean that. Speaking of education, Chuck, there were three prongs to this whole yeah. new world order we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we generally see three legs on a stool, one being political, one being religious, and one being education. We've talked a lot about the political thing, broadly speaking, but uh, let's focus a little on the education side of this thing. Uh, can I talk about, uh, let me pa- uh, pass the ball to you, Dennis. Okay. Uh, previously, I uh, mentioned Cecil Rhodes. Uh, the, the idea in his particular plan, and there were others, there are the Fabian Socialists, and that's a whole other track. 
but was uh, to have uh, key people within about three or four decades penetrate the areas of politics, economics, journalism, and education. And the, the idea would be they would credential individuals who would then become uh, published heads of universities, and they in turn would open doors to the right type of uh, people, namely globalists, that they wanted to in key positions. Uh, you would find that uh, in terms of uh, American education specifically, John Dewey uh, had been head of what's called the League for Industrial Democracy, previously had been titled Intercollegiate Socialist Society. And during the uh, 1920s and 30s, they moved very quickly and talked boldly about collectivizing America. Lazy, fair capitalism would have to go. Uh, we need to develop a new social order. And it hooked in uh, with religion as well, because Dewey was a co-author of the first Humanist Manifesto in 1933. What they were trying to do is shift from the cognitive, academic basics, uh, reading, writing, math, to the social areas, affective, social relationships, because that's important to socialism, the group, rather than the individual. In today's terms, you have cooperative learning uh, under outcome-based education, so they're pushing this along. They had uh, gotten pretty much control of uh, Teachers College at Columbia University and several other key schools. They would set up what was called the Educational Trust uh, in 1915. Uh, shortly after that, the head of the NEA, uh, George Strayer, would say, give them the ax if they don't do what uh, we want them to. And they had developed a, a real network so that they had placement barons to be sure that their type of people were in key positions. And they had, by the 50s and 60s, gotten control right down to the school level so that the 60s is when you saw the shift from the cognitive to the affective right. social promotions started coming great inflation uh, discipline problems and then they moved uh, into the 30 and uh, into the 70s into what uh, the humanist Sidney Hook called a battle of indirection he said we will undermine religion by indirection getting uh, students to have critical thinking so they would question their religion their parents and so forth and so in the 80s, one of the founders of a, uh, the four-member, four-million-member group, H.J. Blackham, said if the schools teach dependence, moral dependence in other ways, on oneself, they are, quote, more revolutionary than any conspiracy to overthrow the government. And that's what they did. They made a generation gap so that the students looked at themselves as autonomous moral decision makers. And that's why you see this rise in juvenile crime today. Interesting. Could you just elaborate on the three planks? Uh, to education, the parents as teachers, the Goal 2000, RBE, and the lifelong learning. Can you elaborate on that as a pattern? Well, uh, parents as teachers is at, at the earliest stage where you supposedly voluntarily ask a uh, parent educator, usually at, at first an older person, but then they will give you younger people, who will come in and, uh, in effect, monitor how you're raising your children. They actually have a checklist. Uh, do you give enough time to your child? I, I have this checklist uh, aside here, but it's a really rather intrusive um, into your privacy of your home checklist. They're getting away with it now by means of volunteerism, but one of the textbooks they used was uh, Arthur Calhoun's The History of the American Family. is a large social service textbook back in 1919. In there, and he was saying how in the future, under socialism, children would be turned more and more over to these community experts. And, and he elaborated on that. And Parents as Teachers is, is that type of program. And it's actually part of Goals 2000, which uh, followed up with President Bush's America 2000. And, and Goals 2000 really is a movement towards nationalizing education. In fact, President Clinton, in his uh, State of the Union just a few days ago, said we need to have high national education standards. You need to adjust your curriculum to uh, reflect those standards. And he said he, over the next two years, would lead in the development of national tests. It's this movement towards nationalizing things which gets you towards socialism, national education, national uh, health care, national police force, national service. Recently, President Clinton and George Bush and Colin Powell uh, got together and wanted to emphasize national service again. It's this tendency towards nationalizing, which is necessary as a phase toward internationalizing. They're already having international standards in education. And, Could, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. And lifelong learning is their vehicle to keep track of you over time. Uh, Mark Tucker, for example, with a Carnegie outfit, said uh, to Hillary Clinton, a board member, that he'd just come out of David Rockefeller's office and they were celebrating Bill Clinton's victory because it would give them a chance to put in place their human resource management system, monitoring people, 
students, everybody, from cradle to grave, the same system for everyone. And so lifelong learning allows them to say, well, we need to track you throughout your whole life. Right, and we're talking about... It's a school-to-work thing. It's a school-to-work thing, right. And we're not just talking about uh, academic performance. It's about a good 50% of it, it's uh, psychological profiling, am I correct? Uh, School-to-work uh, is your skills development, uh, your capability of working with others, and to that extent it gets into your, your psychology. Uh, part of uh, what the educators did was the psychological corporation was set up in 1920, and in there, there's a, an article written shortly thereafter by a, its founder saying, we want to get key people in key places psychologically who are uh, adjusted to, uh, towards our way of thinking. And later on, uh, they, I got the private correspondence that they had between uh, themselves and the first governor's school in the nation that I happened to attend back in 63. And they said, we want to keep files on these people, you know, monitor, track, and, and so forth. It's, it's this grand experiment which goes through Tavistock and England and the National Training Labs, which was set up by the NEA in 1947 and later produced a book called Issues in Human Relations Training, where it refers to their sensitivity training as, quote, brainwashing, quote. So this, there's a whole pattern here. How, how is the link from there into globalism itself? Are there overt efforts to condition people to think as global citizens and to diminish patriotism? Uh, sure. Uh, you have the NEA, for example, 40, 50, 60 years ago, editorializing that we need a world government. That's, that's that sort of thing. Then you have UNESCO being set up uh, with the first director general, Julian Huxley, saying that uh, we'll get people conditioned to think about eugenics down the road. They're not ready now, but we'll get them to do that. And he was one of the, the hardcore Fabians at the time. UNESCO put out a series of books called Toward World Understanding, which said you really need to play down nationalism and emphasize, emphasize internationalism if we're all going to live in peace and harmony. Now, what they try to do is not a direct assault, just like Richard Gardner would say. He wrote piece by piece, and Sidney Hook said by indirection. You want people to slowly adjust to this voluntarily. So what you might find internationally is that uh, we would drastically reduce our military. That would force us to join in with these various peacekeeping efforts. And so about a year or so ago, Americans for the first time were put under foreign commanders, UN commanders. Uh, you might have an outcry against that, just like you might have people outcrying against sex ed. But very slowly, because they control the process, they will get their way. In education, you might not like a superintendent. Even if you get rid of that superintendent, the next one has to be credentialed by the same people. So they control the process. So even when you think you're succeeding because of this process control, they really have a grip on you. That really was dramatized to me, at least, uh, some time ago when this young airman, uh, Michael New, was uh, court-martialed for refusing to take a U.N. uniform. He's perfectly willing to serve whatever they want him to do, but he wanted to do an American uniform because he signed up for the Constitution, not the U.N. And he was court-martialed, discharged from the service, and we were startled by that, uh, dramatizing it. The other thing that hit me recently as I was traveling through Europe, I discovered when you check out of a hotel, they ask your permission to deduct a dollar, to add a dollar to your bill to ship to the United Nations Children's Fund. Now, I'm not against children, but I was really disturbed that it's a delete option. In other words, unless you object, they, whether it's a rent a car or whether it's a hotel, if you're traveling, they, uh, they have a little implied voluntary tax in favor of the so-called UN Children's Fund, whatever that really is. Who knows? But, um, uh, and I'm always fascinated how they even, uh, at Halloween, tried to, you know, use this UNICEF thing, this whole, uh, 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 tied, we see in may, perhaps subtle ways, but uh, it's really uh, surprising. I'm beginning to understand why uh, David Brees, when he wrote his book, The Seven Men Who Rule the World from Their Graves, a neat little book, uh, points out, you know, it includes, of course, John Dewey as one of these guys whose really roots here, uh, uh, you know, underlie much of what we've been talking about. And one reason we've spent this week talking about this is to try to offset the deliberate misinformation and disinformation be promoted by uh, not only the pagan left, but also by uh, Christian and pseudo-Christian authors and even some ministries that are promoting uh, 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 falsehoods, really, among the Christian body, and, and in so doing also are besmirching a number of the Christian leaders. And we felt the one way to, to deal with all of this is to go proactive and just let's get the truth out about the background of what glibly uh, people call the New World Order or the tide toward global governance that goes by several labels. This is not the myth of the wacko right. This is uh, really the agenda uh, 
previously hidden but now quite manifest uh, of the pagan left. Right. So, it's, it's becoming interesting because as, as it bursts forward, and I don't know where I got this quote, but they said when the New World Order finally would make its last dash for the finish line, it would have to do so naked because it would have to throw <laughs> off all of its clothes be seen for what it really was, and then run like heck to make it there before anybody tackles it. See what I'm saying? <laughs> right? Very and graphic, I, John. And very graphic, and I think I think that's that's pretty much where it's at because right now all the Freudians that are listening audience are taking notes, John. But go ahead. <laughs> Don't tell me I'm X Y Z retentive. All right, we'll do that. So anyway, earlier in the week we talked about the three prongs of this new world order. The term new world order. We went through the history of that. We showed that that didn't come from the right. It's been used hundreds of times by people promoting global government. There's a political arm. Uh, we did dealt with education yesterday, and today I know Dr. Cuddy wanted to look at religion. Yeah, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to have you talk about that, Dennis, if you would. Okay. Uh, a lot of times uh, when you talk about uh, the New World Order or something, uh, some conspiracy going on, uh, if it involves international bankers or whatever, the immediate term that comes up is, well, this is some sort of anti-Semitism. Actually, the, the leading people, if you begin a century ago, uh, Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and others, were, were not Jewish at all. Uh, if, if you think about uh, what's going on among the power elite, it's really non-religious. There are people who claim to be of various religions, Catholics, Buddhists, whatever, who would participate among these power elite individuals. And pick it up on what John said, H.G. Wells indicated that uh, in the end, the process would be speeded up and there would be no effective opposition prepared anywhere. Uh, people would have become gradually accustomed, sort of like the frog and the, the water that gets hotter and hotter. And so Wells uh, actually said that this uh, conspiracy, that's the term he used, would be a world religion. It would have that aspect to it. And uh, that was in the same year, 1934, that John Dewey issued uh, his book, A Common Faith, the year after the First Humanist Manifesto, and Dewey was saying in there that dogmatic religions like Christianity would simply have to surrender, because if you're going to have this synthesis, not only economic synthesis of Eastern communism and Western capitalism into a world socialism, and I think Hong Kong is their, their model for this, because that's what will be going on there. In religion, uh, what would happen is a, a synthesis as well, so that you would only have those values that all religions could agree upon. Of course, there goes Jesus Christ out the window, because other religions don't agree on, on him. Uh, the idea progressed uh, in, in various ways, uh, even into the uh, Trilateral Commission, which is an outgrowth to some extent of the Council on Foreign Relations. It was set up in 1973 by uh, David Rockefeller, and Barry Goldwater, in his book With No Apologies, was the title, his autobiography, said that the trilateralists actually wanted not only social, uh, economic, and political control, but they wanted ecclesiastical control as well, because in this uh, one world that they're developing, you, you cannot have any people falling through the gaps. You can't have these fundamentalists, whether they're Christian or Islamic, uh, creating some sort of massive opposition. Now, they try to play down religion, but they know people are interested in spirituality. So mm -hmm. they had to give them a substitute, and that's where the New Age would come in. Interesting. Well, you know, as you talk here, though, it fascinates me because most of us would have assumed, as Christians, we would assume that the attacks on Christianity would come, in effect, from the pagan left. And it's fascinating uh, to realize that among the different techniques to attack Christianity, there are attacks from the Christian left, or I'll, I really probably should almost call it the pseudo-Christian left. We have books that are uh, being published that we view as malicious and deceitful uh, that besmirch uh, the major leaders in the Christian movement, calling them anti-Semitic. Uh, they, t they tend to lump into one bucket the extreme racists, the uh, Christian identity types, the, uh, the uh, anti-Semitic types, and of course there's many of these groups around the country, but they lump them all together under the label of of the patriots or the militia. And uh, what shocks me as I've watched this recently is I see these books not only being, uh, in our view at least, deceitful and malicious and so forth, but they are besmirching some of the most outstanding leadership in the Christian body, guys like Chuck Smith and Pat Robertson and, and others. And uh, uh, it just is uh, startling to me to see the attack come from what I would would have caught, thought as being within the body, not from outside. But see, I think you're bringing up a point that, that, that Dr. Cuddy could address real directly here, and that is it's not an issue of left versus right anymore. Exactly. In Good other point. Words, in other mm -hmm. words, see, as I see it, Dennis, the old debate, okay, is conservative versus liberal. 
I don't see that anymore. It's more socialism, and that's actually a global, global pantheistic socialism versus what we would call individual conscience and sovereignty. Am I, you follow my, my thrust in that one? Sure. Uh, what the, if you're trying to meld East and West uh, so that uh, you get Eastern mysticism accepted in the West, you dress it up in a form that's acceptable, and they would call that uh, the New Age is, is one term. There, there are other terms for it. But uh, in terms of confronting uh, traditional Christians, the, the easiest thing, just like labeling people uh, McCarthyist, is to label them. You know, I will label you as anti-Semitic. Uh, this is an attempt to discredit them. It's part of what you would call the divide and conquer uh, strategy. So wh why is it then we have churches now like the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York uh, being a major New Age center? You're finding in a number of different denominations. Uh, it, it's literal infiltration. You might as well quit calling it Christian. Uh, right, but it's gradual, and it's like uh, Sidney Hook said, by indirection, so that you would have the Temple of Understanding, for example, in the early 60s, it hit people of many, many faiths saying, well, this is a wonderful thing, because they talk about uh, world peace. Isn't peace wonderful? What uh, many of them seem to forget is that when Christ said that he was bringing peace, it was not the peace of this world. It was the peace of understanding Christ and accepting him, which was our road to salvation. You know, there's another, we're in the religious side, but there's another side to this, too, I think, that what John was getting at. We in this country, just looking at our domestic politics, think of Republican versus Democrat, not really, and I think this is where Don McElveen and others say it so well. It's Socialist Party A plus Socialist Party B. The real debate isn't between Republican and Democrat. The real debate is between the socialists, slumping those in that category, and the constitutionalists, the, the ones that, on the one hand, are pushing group things and, in contrast to us, in which we have a heritage of individual merit. On the one hand, the group people saying, you know, truth is really relative. We've got to synthesize all this in contrast to us, in which we claim that we, our creator, underlying creator, has given us God-given rights. They're not man-given, they're God-given, and they have to pull. That's why uh, it's beginning, becoming clear that this religious issue undergirds the whole political thing. The political agenda of going to source socialism has to somehow undermine the idea that our rights are God-given, and therefore not negotiable. They have to be man-given so they can deny them. And I think this is a, the other you know, uh, underlying dimension. John, is that fair? Or is that? Uh... I would say it's, it's floating that way. But, you know, Dennis, as I see it, we at one time talked about secular humanism sort of being the bugaboo that Christians were dealing with. Uh, over the last ten years, I've come to aware that it's, it's actually shifting into almost a, a monistic global pantheism, if that makes any sense. Uh, there's, right. a, there's a change. Right. It, that, that is the focus of many New Age elements, the, the shift from secular humanism. But that was their, their first tool because it had a history, and you could uh, undermine biblical absolutes by teaching moral relativism, that there were no absolute truths. And that's why you would find people today, for example, the baby boomers and Generation X, who've been pounded with that in their schools, and so they don't see anything wrong with uh, it if a president were to happen to have had affairs with uh, other uh, women beside his wife. Well, you know, there's another side to this. John, if you're right, if there's a tide towards pantheism, if that's true, and I think, are, I think it is, uh, then we can predict the next step, because pantheism always migrates into the occult. Pantheism doesn't right. have any leaders. Your right. God is everywhere kind of thing. And it migrates into the occult, which, of course, has a leader who is very identifiable. Right. There's, a, there's yeah. an actual predictable step, but you have to recognize, like Dennis says, you have to recognize where you're at. Exactly. But that's one of the reasons we've indulged in, the, uh, in some of these materials this week and in our, in our other publications, is because this is not just a political issue. This is uh, a, an area of awareness that's essential if one is going to really understand, first of all, biblical prophecy, because the Bible has always portrayed that the world is going to migrate to a globalism and to that will eventually be taken over by a, a leader, a uh, coming world leader. Right. And uh, there's much to be said about that. The Christians who talk about uh, opposing a new world order, I think, well, how did you how did you think an Antichrist was going to get here? <laughs> I mean, did you think he was going to appear on Main Street one day wearing a red suit and a tail? <laughs> we have been going over all of this week, Chuck and Dennis, the history of the New World Order and the words of the people who uh, have put it together. New World Order was a term created basically by people as a proponent of global government. Uh, it was used as late as uh, just a few years ago, as a matter of fact, until it became actually a, a political liability. And on July 18th, and this was in the Los Angeles Times of 1993. Henry Kissinger was saying concerning NAFTA, what Congress will have before it is not a conventional trade agreement, but the architecture of a new international system, a first step towards a new world order. 
Uh, other people say we have to let go of national sovereignty to get into this new world order. They're telling you very clearly what it is they intend to do. And it's happening. If you heard the State of the Union message, it's global this, global that. We talked earlier in the week about education, about religion, and we need to do a wrap-up on it. So, Dr. Cuddy, I'll let you lead this one. Okay. Uh, picking up on what you just said, there was, uh, I think it was in 1995, September 24th, where the Washington Post itself referred to the power elite as uh, the powers that be, the hidebound elite who run the world. They had an article in there talking uh, about what Gorbachev was doing. Uh, yesterday in the program, I believe Chuck and you were talking about the convergence of socialism with what was now the successor to secular humanism, a sort of pantheistic monism. Right. And that process also has been going on for a long time. In fact, if you look at the Wizard of Oz, the, the symbolism in that is that uh, there is a god within, and you can save Mother Gaia, symbolized by uh, Dorothy, if you use your heart and your mind and courage. That would be the, the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion. And th this is, in my view, this, this writing comes right out of the Theosophical Society, one of the uh, biggest esoteric uh, organizations around. And what you have in terms of socialism is it's not just the socialism of the left, like the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, but remember that Nazism really stood for National Socialism, and they were heavily into the occult. In fact, uh, when the Russians came into Berlin at the end of the Second World War, they found a thousand Tibetan lamas in Nazi uniforms there because uh, one of uh, Hitler's people had brought them from the Far East. Uh, and the gradual erosion of what I would call traditional Christianity can be seen, uh, I suppose, by an example. If, if you ask people if they were familiar with the book of Revelations, they say, sure I am. If you'd ask them, uh, well, do you, uh, would you take a number on your forehead or your hand without which you could buy or sell nothing, they would say, oh, that's, uh, that's the mark of the beast. I, surely I wouldn't do that, you know, the Antichrist and all that. But then if you ask them, well, would you take this nice little card, this smart card with a number on it with that, without which you couldn't buy or sell anything, I'm afraid you'd be surprised a lot of Christians would think that was just fine. But then what you're saying basically is that it's, a, it's an ongoing process That's of, right. of indoctrination. If you look at the writing, say, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer during World War, well, prior to World War II, in which... So many Lutheran and evangelical pastors in Germany fell for the Third Reich. And they, first of all, didn't believe the Nazis were going to do what they said they were. Everybody in our country now, you know, we've had Indiana Jones and war movies out the, out the kazoo, and we all look at Nazis as being bad things. We forget that Nazi or German society embraced them to a large degree as being good. And there were segments of the U.S. that was also supportive, too, prior to the real outbreaks. Prior, prior to the real outbreaks. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, we start, talked about there are churches now. If you go to certain churches, I keep thinking of uh, St. John the Divine. Uh, there was the cathedral in Denver. They were talking about Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. We're talking about the Episcopal Cathedral in Denver. And they, they're bowing to the earth there, and they bow to the east and the north and the west. It's all part of a service. This is just total infiltration. You look at Matthew Fox in the, in the Catholic Church and his introduction of, of uh, goddess worship and things of that nature. So those are the well, overt ones, but there's well, more we, subtle stuff. Well, we see that going on right now. We've made reference to the fact that you know, there's so-called people who try to masquerade as Christians publishing books to the Christian market from Christian publishers uh, that are, you know, clearly anti-Christian, that are uh, besmirching, you know, we, we talked about that earlier. It's interesting to see this uh, happening. You know, as you look at uh, Hal Lindsey's famous book, The Road to Holocaust, points out that the Holocaust in Europe needs to be laid at the feet of the pulpits in Europe that were silent. The church got duped. The church, and we, you know, I see a real analogy between the ineffectiveness of the uh, church community in Germany during the, the Holocaust period, and I see the same thing happening today. There are pulpits in America where pastors are uh, uh, sort of arguing that the, you know, our, our kingdom is not of this world and, and, and almost preach an attitude of ignorance toward what's happening in this country. Not, I'm not saying that we should go towards political activism necessarily. I'm saying that we should at least be aware of what's going on and not label people who are sounding the alarm concerning the erosion of our heritage as some kind of wacko nuts, but uh, really one of uh, being the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the watchman, if you will. But in the light of that, though, Dennis, if we were to what, what just Chuck said, I think the reason a lot of the inaction is taking place is a, is a gradual process of brainwashing in the media. We can lay that one at their feet. 
Uh, sure, and uh, you see various films. There's a good one called Question 7 that's put out, I believe, by some Lutheran organizations. It, it takes place after World War II when the Soviets are actually coming in, but it's the same thing Chuck was talking about. It's an award-winning film. It's very good. Uh, you also have a later film, uh, Brotherhood of the Bell, where it's talking about how the media can be used. Uh, the person played by William Conrad in there is giving Glenn Ford uh, a hard time, and it shows how he, as a member of the media, will try and discredit anybody talking about uh, a sort of conspiracy. But uh, the process started way back. Well, William Paley in 1928 was beginning uh, CBS, and he hired as his chief uh, advisor Edward Bernays, who was uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, and in that same year, Bernays authored a book called Propaganda, where he said, uh, in effect, uh, we in the media know how to manipulate uh, your opinions, we form an invisible government, and he goes on and on like that, how they can do pretty much what they want. They were picking up to some extent on Antonio Gramsci. Uh, Gorbachev and his wife were disciples of Gramsci. He was a Marxist revolutionary saying, uh, we don't have to have a bloody revolution. We will change the consciousness by changing the culture. That way we'll undermine religion. Uh, Aldous Huxley, after he wrote Brave New World, wrote The Devils of Loudon, in which he was describing how various aspects of the media and entertainment, music, and so forth could be used to uh, change. He's, I think he said... Uh, never have so few been in a position to make uh, criminals, maniacs uh, of so many at, at one time by use of uh, various aspects of the media. Uh, you would have uh, Theodore Adorno, another revolutionary, saying, well, you could do this by fractious music. He was alluding to rock music with the interim step of, uh, I guess, rock and roll. So you'd have people, uh, I mean, groups like The Who or Jefferson Airplane saying, yes, this music is a great revolutionary type of music. We can create this generation gap. We can get kids away from their parents' values. Now, today, what you have in the media and entertainment, you'll see a lot of flashing images and single eyes coming at you. And your ordinary reaction to that is to turn it off. It's, it's annoying to you. But what they found is that in the 80s, there was a, a principle called hyper-reality, where it's like a gunshot. You react to a gunshot by absorbing information. You're not in an analytic mode, mode. You're absorbing it. And so if they can fill 30-second spot ads with this type of hyper-reality where you're in a sort of uh, survival instinct where you constantly see things that are not in your normal experience, you know, a Nike shoe or whatever swirling at you, you're absorbing rather re than reflecting. And so that comes into your uh, consciousness. It doesn't make you walk out immediately uh, like some robot and buy a, a Nike or whatever it is, but it's in your process, your, your mental faculty, and if they flash that image ten times, there's ten registrations in your brain of that type of thing so that later when you are going to buy a shoe, at least Nike will be present in your mind. And so there's this hyper-reality which follows what uh, George Orwell had said in 1984 when the person um, was uh, saying to O'Brien, Big Brother's agent, the people will never fall for this. They'll never go with this. And he said, ah, but what if we quicken the tempo of human life? Because when they do that, you're busy. You know, I've got to go to the shop, I've got to go to the store, I've got to go to the dentist, I've got to pick up the kids. And you're so busy that you're never able to sit down and reflect on what they're doing to manipulate you. That's interesting. You know, uh, uh, maybe a more prosaic example of this that shocked me is in, to, into an awareness. Uh, it wasn't that long ago they were circulating a video called the Clinton Chronicles, which, of course, had a lot of fascinating interviews. I think most people, most uh, discerning people in America have seen or heard about that video. To me, the most shocking interview on that entire collection was the interview with Don Hewitt, the executive producer of 60 Minutes, where he brags on camera that they successfully withheld from the American people the truth about Clinton in order to get him through the New Hampshire primary. This is in their you know, first election there. And it fascinated me. Here is a major executive of the media bragging that they, they made public opinion rather in, than informing it. And it, I think most of us uh, that are so busy, as you just highlighted, uh, as executives or whatever, um, sort of presume that the, the media is competitive and it's, and it's their job is to inform its public as part of its mission, and yet we find that they're really uh, deceitfully uh, uh, part of the machinery to form and shape agendas rather than to report what's happening. Yes, they'll, they'll admit that. The ombudsman for the Washington Post, Richard Harwood, actually wrote a column back in 93 where he listed all the names of the media and press and said these people no longer report the news. They make it with the Council on Foreign Relations. He was listing the membership. And the 30s, uh, part of this group, Cecil Rhodes' followers, 
said uh, in a book about uh, the London Times, it says they have this meeting at All Souls College or, or so forth at Oxford, and they decide what you do not hear. It's not just what they tell you, it's what they decide to keep from you. And in terms of music, uh, Bertrand Russell wrote how you could have verses repeatedly intoned was a good conditioning aspect. So now, unlike the 40s and 50s where you would have a song, you could actually hear the lyrics, it delivered a message, you keep hearing this beat over and over again, and the same words repeated over and over again. That's a conditioning tool. It's like a mantra in essence is what sure. it is. Tell you what, we are totally out of time for this week, Dr. Cuddy. Thank you for being on Chuck's show here. Thank you for having me. And Dr. Cuddy's books are available from the Florida Pro Family Forum. They are at P.O. Box 1059, Highland City, Florida, H-I-G-H-L-A-N-D, City, Florida, 33846. His most outstanding works here are The Road to Socialism and The New World Order. The Secret Records Reveal the Men, the Money, and the Methods Behind the New World Order. He also has done The History of Education in Quotable Quotes. These are nothing but quotes from the people who have determined American education from the turn of the century in their words. It gives you a very clear insight as to why we are where we are. In his latest book out now, Conspiracy, Secret Records Revealed, Convincing Evidence for Those in Pursuit of the Truth. For a complete listing of materials to further enhance your personal Bible study or to receive a free one-year subscription to Chuck Missler's 32-page Christian Intelligence News Journal. Contact Koinonia House at 1-800-K-HOUSE-1. That's 1-800-K-H-O-U-S-E-1. To fax your correspondence, dial 208-773-6312. Or you can write to Koinonia House at P.O. Box D, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, 83816-0347.